Um, I'm very happy to be here, um, to be back here, and I'm very happy there is this productive partnership between the school I represent and Parallel Polis, because indeed there is a lot of room for mutual cooperation. First few things about my background, I, I'm president of a private college, private small private university located in Prague, uh, in the very historical center of Prague. Um, the college is private, uh, so we get no money from the government at all. I have to compete with heavily subsidized public schools. Um, and to do it, our very recent achievement was accreditation of a program which is very unique locally, uh, meaning in the Czech Republic, but also perhaps on the European continent. We started a program called PPE, Philosophy, Politics, Economics. Um, and within this program, to which, by the way, students from over 25 countries from all over the world came and study. Uh, you can specialize in many things, one of them being what I spent some time to developing in the Czech Republic, and that is the ideas of the so-called Austrian School of Economics. So this branch of economics, which is very much in favor of competition, freedom, private property, and the like. My talk today will be dev devoted to the problem of anarchy. And uh, maybe the title could be confusing for some people. I call it anarchy as a conservative program. I believe that many people, not necessarily in this room, but generally believe that anarchy is first associated with chaos, and second, that it's about some sort of revol revolutionary change. I will claim that both of these uh, statements are not correct, that actually there can be, and often is, order producing anarchy, and second, that the ideas behind arguments in favor of anarchy are actually far from revolutionary, that as you will see, hopefully, we will, we will show that very conservative, common sense, n normal ideas are perfectly fine to justify social order, which can be characterized as anarchy. Um, in the 20th century, we lived through horrible time, the reason mostly being that people for some reason wanted to experiment with monopolization of state power. Uh, that we went through all these horrible experiments of international socialism, national socialism, and today, at least here, we are in this phase of democratic socialism, or as many people call it, participatory fascism. Uh, simply that nominally we have around us property owners, people nominally are listed as those who actually decide how exactly, let's say, to run their businesses. But in reality, it is not the owners who decide, uh, because in more and more instances, those nominal owners have to do what the state tells them. Um, so ho at least the horrors of national and international socialism were replaced by a society which is freer, however still, far from achieving full, peaceful, harmonious cooperation among people. We've learned some lessons so far, at least. Namely, that experimenting too much with institutionalized violence doesn't bring us good life. 
rather than ending in the world of prosperity and peace, we too often end up in the world of violence and poverty. So, at least in this country, we've learned a lesson of maybe attractive idea of central planning and communism, but hopefully people now understand it's not the way to go, that rather than having center planning, it's better to replace it by individual planning. Rather than having political means as the core way how to get income, meaning rather than having access to other people's money, it's better to rely on economic means, that is production, trade, peaceful voluntary exchange. Rather than having society based on coercion, it's better to let people decide what they want. Or another perspective can be, rather than having no choice, that is, rather than having monopolies, monopolistic providers of goods, services, is actually much more preferable to have competition. Um, so this is the lesson which um, shows us that when we eliminate those top-down relations and replace it with horizontal relations and bottom-up development, um, we actually can see the beauty of uh, individually based societies, uh, which is nicely characterized by this quote uh, by Robert Nozick, which, which says that in a free society, all capitalist, that is voluntary acts, between consenting adults should be legal. This is what freedom means. Grown-up people can enter into activities which they both want, irrespective of you know, the sort of morality of it. As long as these acts are peaceful and voluntary, should be allowed. Um, now, such a society shows us, uh, or can be described in three different dimensions. The first is manifestation of freedom, that is, in, in such a society when voluntary capitalist acts, acts among or between consenting adults will be legal, people pursue their lives. Uh, and pursue their happiness. And people pursuing different goals and different objectives can peacefully live next to each other. There is no conflict. Um, it gives such a society, people, choice to pursue their virtues and vices. That is, in such a society, and only in such a society, people can do these generous acts of charity and show that they actually care about other people. On the other hand, they can do things which are not necessarily super nice. They can, you know, take drugs. Uh, but taking drugs might be, you know, problematic for your health. However, does not contradict the concept of capitalist acts between consenting adults being the building stone of a free society. And as long as people have freedom to do both good things and bad things, and then they decide to do good things, only then we can actually show what you know, true civilization means, that we have the right to do things which are not nice, and we, don't then, we do not do, do them because we decide not to. 
And indeed, this manifestation of freedom in such a society means that I can associate with who I want. And indeed, the flip side of the same coin is that you know, I should have right to disassociate with people I do not like. I, be it employees, be it buyers, be it business partners, sim simply freedom means the right to have yes to a contract, and it also means the right to have no to a contract. Saying no is a peaceful act, it is a capitalist act between consenting adults. Uh, you know, I do business with someone, I consent to some trade, and I say no to someone else. And this should be true in a free society, in all spheres of human life, as long as it is peaceful. When people have this freedom, then indeed they can generate prosperity, uh, and the whole science of economics, and I'm an economist, is about, is about it. So once people have freedom to do business, to be entrepreneurial, well, then they produce prosperity. Uh, division of labor happens, people specialize in different things, people are innovative, um, people have incentives to satisfy other, pe other people's preferences, and so on and so forth. So not only do we have freedom in such a society, but we, be we become richer. And again, in a free society, this manifestation of freedom, production of wealth, improvement of life, should be allowed in all spheres of human life. Uh, and has to be done in all situations where economic problems exist. That is, we have limited sources or resources, and we want to achieve uh, a lot of goals. So we have to find smart ways how to make our life better. Well, and the third dimension of such a free society is that it actually will be a just society. People exercise their rights, their rights are respected and protected, and all people have the same rights. Nobody is above them. So, so there are, such a society is a society with no privileges, right? Only voluntary exchanges happen, and if somebody wants to exercise violence, then he or she is stopped. Again, if we want to have a free society, it has to be done in all spheres of human life. Now, economists have known this at least since the time of Adam Smith. Uh, he advocated the system of economic anarchy, meaning absence of politicization of production with the result being order. So ordered society produced by free activities of individual. Um, and Adam Smith at the end of the 18th century said that nothing more is needed to produce better life than peace, easy taxes, and tolerable system of justice. And these things only for the two reasons, or for, or two, th uh, yes, two reasons, which are first, you have to eliminate predation. So he believed the state should be here to catch criminals, thieves, and robbers. And second, indeed, public predation also should not be allowed. So he believed the state should be very small, that's why easy taxes. And the rest is, you know, markets, people's cooperation only. So Adam Smith advocated economic anarchy and saw a small role for the state. The role of the state was to eliminate predation. However, the consequences, in the 20th century at least, was that the state did many things 
And among those things, he was killing people. I make a reference to this book by uh, uh, Professor Rummel, who calculated how many people got killed in the 20th century only by their own governments during peacetime. Right? And it's quite a lot of people. So, isn't it kind of naive to believe the state will do good things only if we have this empirical evidence? Um, and hence, not only economists, but political scientists and other people started to go beyond Smith and said, well, we actually have to study or extend anarchy beyond what Smith believed is the proper room for anarchy. And hence, this whole project of analytical anarchism got started by several people I have here. Professor Peter Betke from George Mason University, who, by the way, is the one who is the director of the Austrian specialization in our PPE program here in Prague. And, you know, very recently, a lot of books got published on anarchy by leading publishing houses, Oxford, Cambridge in this case. Uh, and those books simply say the obvious. You know, if we somehow believe it's good to have peaceful cooperation in order to have quality services, then it's good for all services, including defense, security, law, and so on and so forth. And indeed, a lot of scholars historically devoted their scholarly effort to explanation of these things. I have Murray Rothbard here, David Friedman, David Friedman, Nobel Prize winning economist Vernon Smith, but also modern authors such as David Carbeck, who studied social order in American prisons. This is all about ways how order is introduced without political authority. Uh, and indeed, a big and maybe the biggest classic of all is Gustave de Molinari, who in mid 19th century, he was a French economist, and he said, well, you know, if we are all in favor of competition, how come that suddenly when it comes to security production, we say, hey, here we have to have monopoly, and somehow believe, the, you know, good results will follow. You know, why? Um, if monopoly is bad, then state mon monopoly, you know, is bad too. Uh, if we need in every society a service which is called provision of security, elimination of predation, well, then we have to have a good quality service of this sort. Um, and, and hence, you know, the argument is, well, just use these simple arguments in favor of competition to things which even classics, uh, let's say, of political economy or political philosophy believed that should belong to the state. No, and now here is why. Um, you know, the I argument for anarchy is conservative because it's argument f in favor of order. Uh, harmonious existence of peaceful people. And the peace and prosperity, as we mentioned, is created by society. And society is a completely different animal than the state. So the argument is, you know, society, which means individuals and families and, you know, association, social elite, and so on, they jointly engage in mutually beneficial contracts, cooperation, trade, and so on. Uh, so there is nothing like crazy and, and, you know, it's not an argument for experimentation. It's just a good argument for when you allow peaceful people living next to each other, they will help each other out. Um, the argument is against experiment to entrust power and award privileges to some you know, political entities. Why should we ever do it? Especially given what we know about the, you know, the potential, disastrous potential of state activities. Um, 
the argument for anarchy rests on the claim that in a just society, people should have equal rights. I have and should have the same right as, as you, independent of the job you do. Unlike today, if you work today for the government, you, know, you often have higher or more rights than what I do. If you work for you know, tax collecting authority, you can come to my house, take my money. Uh, so, you know, this is not equal rights for everyone. So, um, the argument, be it the old Molinari's argument for private protection of security or some sort of modern equivalent of it, is actually a very simple and traditional argument uh, in Which, which, which says that if you have a right to protect yourself against other people, robbers and thieves, well, you, you, you indeed have the right to delegate your right to someone else. So this, for the same reason why when I need shoes, I go to a shoemaker because he's an expert on providing what I need. You know, by the same logic, when I need protection against thieves and robbers, I should have the right to go to an expert who will protect me. Private protection agency. You know, it's simple division of labor uh, given the right I have. Protect myself against violence. And indeed, if I have, and I believe I have, and all of us have, the right to dis disassociate, so if I have the right to say no, well then, logically applied to its ultimate uh, conclusion, it means the right to secession. So, now if some people claim that we have the right to secede from the European Union as the Czech Republic, well, then, you know, parts of what today is the Czech Republic, people who don't want to live under the political authority of the Czech Republic should have the right to secede. Then cities should have the right to secede from larger units. Then individual city districts should have the right to secede. Why not? Well, then, ultimately, you know, an individual has the right and should have the right to secede from a political authority which he doesn't want to live under, right? If not, tell me why. And it is not a radical idea, it's simply a logical application of, at some level, we all believe that you know, such a right exists. Um, and all this argument in favor of competition, secession, individual rights, and so on, can be applied to other, indeed, many other spheres of, of life. And that's why we have this call for depolitization of money, hence, you know, free money, denationalization of money, or Bitcoin. Same can be applied to the protection of environment, which today many people believe only state can give us you know, this service protection of environment, no, hence free market environmentalism, uh, you know, and so on and so on. To sum up, I believe there is no logical, consistent argument in favor of power of some people over other people. Uh, hence, we have a strong argument for anarchy, which, however, rests on all those old-fashioned principles such as individual autonomy, right to contract, right to defend yourself, and so on and so forth. And if it, we are not somehow able to put this vision of social reality uh, into our life at large, well, at least it's good there are things and places such as Paralenipolis where you can have islands of relative freedom. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, please, for the questions, wait for the mic with, with your question. I have um, two possible questions for you. I was just wondering how do you justify or um, give um, an authority, or not even authority, a justification for property rights or what defines someone's right to property? Mm -hmm. And yeah, if you could answer that, then I'll say what it is. Well, it's all the right from the plain fact that people own should own themselves. So it's the self-ownership, something which I guess it's not only commonsensical, but it's also rooted in the tradition of you know, Western law, let's say. Uh, and the right to property is, a, is an extension of the right to self-ownership, because we have something to do with an entrepreneurial activity of my body, which I own, and the interaction with unowned resources. So if nobody claims a piece of nature around me and I'm the one who transforms that into a product, then the product becomes mine. Then if you want it, you have to come to me and try, try to you know, make a deal with me. If I agree, then the property gets transferred to you. Um, so the, or put from different perspective, the strongest case on a unowned piece of nature around me, kind of obviously, I believe, has the guy who is there first rather than the second or third or fourth or you know one one hundredth or something. Uh, so. This is a simple general argument, how unowned property becomes somebody's property. Or as uh, John Locke uh, explained, it, property emerges when you mix your labor with unowned uh, piece of nature or land. Okay, uh, another question. Thanks for the talk first. Um, you talked a lot about like shared values and things that anarchists and conservatives had in common. Um, are there any issues or values or positions where the two movements actually are separated or would have, yeah, would need a, a discussion on? And sorry, by the two movements you mean what? Anarchists and conservatives. Uh, like classical conservatives, classical anarchists. Well, what I'm trying to argue here is that uh, this anarchism or anarcho-capitalism or anarcho-libertarianism is simply a logical extension of classical liberal slash conservative argument of the 19th century, what today constitutes textbooks. Uh, and uh, the, the only difference simply is that the classical liberal argument says, you know, we need this uh, non-market framework which will create room for then peaceful coexistence and the framework is what the state should do, and those anarcho-capitalists, libertarians say, well, what if not? What if, what if the state is here to protect me and is actually attacking me? Then shall I, do I have an argument for not entrusting those huge powers to a monopolistic agency? And they say, there is a very good argument not to do it, especially given the, um, empirical evidence of the 20th century and before, right? So I would say we can um, we can argue that there was hope, um, by the way, formulated in many uh, histor important historical documents such as the United States Constitution that if you somehow manage to tie states' hands to do only those few things which 
allegedly has to be done, that then somehow peace and prosperity will follow, and we see that there is no like legal uh, constraint which can prevent states from growing, irrespective of where the states are. We see what is happening in the United States and in Europe and elsewhere, states which were supposed to be small and just provide security and peace, consuming a little fraction of people's income, you know, suddenly take half of what people make and do, do a lot of activities which, has, which have nothing to do with protection of people, their property, peace, harmony. Uh, it's more about you know, taking from majorities and then uh, you know, like subsidizing minorities, uh, rich minorities. So the state became a tool for very few people who managed to somehow manipulate the state in their favor. Uh, so it became the tool of getting money and w wealth which they would not be able to get just by offering some products to people because simply today very often big businesses, not all, but a lot of them are at the same time biggest recipient of subsidies and all the rest of it. And you know, who, came, who can actually meaningfully advocate uh, or bring forward arguments in favor of such a system? I guess it's very difficult and we have to just be realistic about it, you know. Hi, um, I have a kind of a basic question, although I don't know if I have a very good answer for it. So I'm wondering what you think about the idea of um, with, with violence and uh, hiring pr private security forces and stuff, how do you, how does anarchism solve the, the concept of um, just, uh, you know, the kind of uh, protection money mafia style thing where there's crime that's happening and then they're like, oh, we can protect you from it and that type of yep, stuff. Yep, yep. Well, good question. Um, and indeed, uh, and maybe it's worth it to mention that indeed historically you had anarchists who somehow, and by the way, communists as well, who believed that you know, first you have somehow to change people so that everybody is good or something, and then this new system will work. You know, this is not what, what this analytical anarchism is. Here it is indeed assumed that people are both good and bad, that there are thieves around us and robbers and crazy people around us. Uh, and maybe that's why it's not you know, useful to privilege some people because the thieves and robbers and crazy people can become you know, governmental officials. And then what do you do? How do you protect yourself, right? So this is one, one take on it. And what is like the alternative or you know, how, else can we have, how else can we have security? Well, you know, contract division of labor. So private agencies who, who uh, will be contractually bound to provide only services which you know they promise to provide for a specific amount of money, right? Then, if the private agency does something else or wants to charge you more money, well, you have a contract in your hand and say, no, now you are becoming a you know, mafia because this is not what you were supposed to do. You you do not have claim over my money. But this, you know, you may say, well, but in, you know, the states also have some kind of legislative contract with you. Yeah, but the contract is com constantly changing. Uh, and again, empirically, but you see historically, you know, what started small became big. Government started to claim more and more money and started fighting more and more wars against people who were not threat to you know the population the governments were supposed to protect. So. Private agencies, now you may say, well, what if some agency will behave like a state? Okay, well then, you know, th that's the worst scenario, that the private agency, which will be contractually bound, will behave like a state. But today, we have the state already, so like the worst scenario is current situation. And very good reasons why, and there are books about it indeed, uh, you know, this, uh, 
the worst scenario, that means monopolization of originally competing agency, why that would not happen. But again, nothing is sure. You only can analyze, and you know, this, the whole project, analytical anarchism is, well, let's analyze, uh, let's say, the stability and quality of services, including security services, provision of money, and so on, when you have private competing system and monopolized system. And I guess that's all what it is. And, you know, then you know, do the research. If you want to argue for monopolistic provision of money, okay, well, try it. You know, I wish you luck, given what the central banks have done in the 20th century, right? Would any private pro provider of money, could, could anyone uh, behave, you know, any, any worse than what the state did? You know, do, do you believe I mentioned this 260 million people killed by government during peacetime? Do, can you imagine that a private agency like Coca-Cola, private agency, you know, killing 200 million people? So, you know, just, you know, I call for realistic evaluation of possible good and bad outcome under two different institutional scenarios, competition contract versus politics and monopoly. That's all. Um, thank, uh, uh, where, yeah, okay, good, yeah. Go thank you for, uh, for starting that bit about um, the, the, the private security versus the state security. Uh, I'm trying to imagine the scenario where, well, the private security, if, if I'm rich enough, I'll get the private security will secure me my or more of my rights better against this small guy over there whose private security is not as well equipped. Not as, the, the small guy will just have to you know, step back from the line between, you know, if I say my, my garden ends over here because I have a bigger mm -hmm. guy, your garden will end over there, will mm -hmm. start, you mm -hmm. know, because you have a small guy to, to protect your garden. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the state, uh, there is supposed to be this this political feedback, where uh, the state actually lays out these these evils are evenly distributed, are more evenly sorry not evenly they are more evenly distributed than those evils who are localized to the big guy versus the small guy. What what do you have to say to that? Um, again. I mentioned several authors who devoted their life to study historical instances of uh, legal systems which were not uh, monopolized. And you know, you, you have a st strong argument for uh, believing in the market process, so elimination of these crooks from the system under competition. Uh, you know, it's e more easily to be imagined in commercial activities. So the whole, let's say, medieval law merchant was actually privately produced law because uh, traders traded, you know, over uh, long distances. So there was like there were like n you know national legal monopolistic legal systems, but those parties of the contract were from different states. So actually, you know, they didn't have anyone above and hence mechanisms how to resolve conflicts developed. Um, so we have historical instances of that. We have wonderful books written, uh, I will mention one, uh, by Terry Anderson and P.J. Hill. It's called The Not So Wild Wild West, which actually talks about U.S. towards the, let's say, 8th of the 19th century, the Western frontier, where formerly was American government, but no American a governmental agents. But there were actually activities, commercial, both commercial and generally social activities, and sometimes conflict happened, and they had to discover, you know, solutions to, to the problem, to eliminate predation, to catch thieves and robbers, and it's nicely described how how it worked. Uh, sometimes the whole countries worked under under the system, uh, you know, Ireland before British took over medieval Iceland, and so on and so forth. So there, there is a lot of cases, and today we have like uh, instances not on a national scale, but more like a club, 
club scale, so sometimes stock exchanges operating under private truth. All the, both the books I presented at the beginning, published by Cambridge and Oxford, Peter Leeson and Ed Stringham, they, they actually address these issues uh, in different circumstances. Uh, people who never maybe thought about it or read about it will be surprised how many activities today in the world in the world of states are actually organized uh, by private rules right so so maybe you can rephrase the whole pro, the whole debate about like anarchy it's a debate about how well private rules operate how do they emerge and how do you enforce them Right, and then it doesn't doesn't sound you know, radical at all, because we all have a lot of experience with a lot of systems of private rules, be it you know like things like you know Visa card, PayPal, or you know these these things where. Uh, or cases like you know when uh, Jewish traders trade diamonds, and when they have conflict, they never go to the state court. They have mechanisms how to, how to do it. So there are like tons and tons of instances how private rules actually work better than you think, which is the subtitle of one of those books. Hi. Hi. So uh, I hope my question won't be very primitive as I'm not very good in this discussion. But in one of our family debates, and as I asked uh, Tomas a question, I didn't get a satisfying answer, so I'm going to ask you. <laughs> so. That's that. Uh, assuming that, based on what you said, that if if I own some some something first, like a land first, I'm the owner. So I have a land, and suddenly I f I found a very big source of oil in it, uh -huh. and so I'm afraid in this world of anarchy, I'm afraid that my neighbors want to attack me and get my land and with my source. So I'm hiring a um, private mm. army for myself. And, but this m money that I have is endless somehow when I have oil, when I have oil. So how, what would protect me against this army? How much I should pay them? The best idea is that I pay them half and half. So half of that would be mine, half of that would be them. But again, what would protect me against them to kill me and get my land in such a world? Okay. Again, just, you know, take a look at the reality of today's world. Our world is full of governments who perform like mafias, exactly the way you described, that, you know, uh, natural resources found on somebody's land, and then the state army comes and takes over. And all these dictators then, you know, have a source of living for years. Um, so, it, sure, it can happen, but it's not in one system only where it can happen. It can, it can happen at, you know, in both, well, with like system of private rules and system of monopolized governmental services. Um, and Excuse me, yeah. that was the answer that I got from Tomas. So, I, well, I'm not satisfied. <laughs> okay, so it was a good answer. Uh, and, and then, you, you know, you have to, if you want to compare realistically, well, then the history is, f is full of examples. So there, is n there is no um, question about the fact that you need the rule of law. You need legal protection against robbers and thieves. Uh, if you want to live in a peaceful society. A civilized society. But then the question is, how do you get more quality peace, better, cheaper services of protection? And I'm just saying that it is not that the obvious answer is governments will provide it. Because, you know, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they behave like thugs and mafias. So I just want to bring a comparative framework uh, and not state as a solution, as a default solution. We, can th we have time for one more question. Thanks, hi. So um, what, from what I understand, 
is um, the individual is the center of anarchy, and that uh, makes responsibility of the individual the backbone of anarchy. So in my everyday life, I experience many people that are unable, and the vast majority that is unwilling to take over uh, responsibility for their actions. So let's talk about change. Mm. We are living in a current system that is far from anarchy. So uh, if we're talking about this very nice idea of anarchy, we also have to take to, uh, into account that we need to change the mindset of people, which is a very, very, from my point of view, a very uh, hard thing to get people to take over responsibility. So is there any discourse or um, philosophical idea or um, research on how that can be accomplished from getting from this system we're living in today into this very responsibility-centered system of anarchy? Well, I don't agree with the premise of your argument. I, I don't believe we first have to change people to establish a peaceful society. It, th this is this utopian, either socialism or anarchism. Uh, no, we have to work with people as they are. Uh, many irresponsible behavior today is a consequence of all sorts of, you know, let's say, you know, uh, social programs or, you know, socialized medicine. People then, once you can, um, you know, behave irresponsibly and let other people pay the bill, but then you will do it. And the more generous very often states are in helping people, the more irresponsible behavior they create. So what I'm calling for is not changing people, it's, it's protecting rights. Um, and hence, you know, then I will create situation when people pay for their own mistakes it's like, you know, if you have an insurance of your car and you hit the wall, well, then it's bad, but you have insurance. You kind of, you know, thought about it before. If you don't have an insurance and hit the wall, well, tough luck, you lost, you know, the car and, you know, maybe get injured. But it will be you who bears the cost of your irresponsibility. Um, at the same time, the system which I'm talking about is a system where you can have communities of people living peacefully next to each other. You can have religious groups who will, you know, uh, be, let's say, believe in certain uh, virtues, how to live your life, and you will have other groups next door who will simply behave strangely seen from the perspective of the first group. And they still, as long as rights are respected, they can live peacefully uh, next to each other. The problem arises when you start democracy with those two groups, let's say, and then you have like you know, majority voting, you know, what will be supported by taxpayers' money? You know, and then the first group wants that you know you you have to have let's say you know uh, religion in elementary school, and the other group says you know you have to have uh, you know sex education or something, and and as if there was one good model of how to live for all people, it is not, and we have to. You know, take that into account. You know, we may strongly believe into something, but other people may have the complete opposite view. Well, that's what society is. People are different. Then we have to have our autonomous little islands of our own uh, rule, which is called private property. That's why that must be the core value and core social institution. Thank you for your questions, thank you for your answers, but in the first place, thank you for your talk. Thanks a lot. <laughs>